The Vampire Testament 2 Revelations The low-hanging haze that continued to hug the grounds remained thick and palpable. The mists embraced the ankles of the newborn undead who was standing beside the wet and muddy ramshackle ruin of his coffin, which was still cloaked in rusted, broken chains. Nocturnal insects slowly crept and crawled over its hull, inspecting the textures of the surface and the rust flakes on the chain links, looking like browsers at a bazaar. The night remained black and with a slight breeze. The vampire watched as Satan made a slow stride outside of the ancient graveyard gates. He watched through a curious form of vision at the swaying cloak of the devil and the subsequent footfalls of his cloven hooves as they met the moist ground. He looked through sight that would have been perceived by people of the modern technological age as glitchy video, and he swayed to and fro stupidly like a tower in high winds. At this particular moment, he felt lost. Although he knew through a newly awakened subconsciousness that he had a purpose, as well as a new life, a voice in his mind that seemed to come from some distant time and place rattled out a staggering assertion, You are damned. This stilled his swaying and sent a shiver down his spine for a minute. He stood with his head in his hands, much the way he did when he faced the devil upon his resurrection. The sounds of the insects surrounding the cemetery seemed to increase in volume. The intensity of the noise seemed to grow steadily, causing the vampire pain. The searing noise grew. His pain grew. And as his pain grew, so did his fury. This infuriating dissonance ripped through his ears, and he began to roar himself. In a brief few seconds as to what seemed like an eternity to him, both he and the night bugs delivered a deafening chorus of screams. And in a wink, it was silent, and the night was still again, save for his heavy gasps as he continued to hold his hands tightly to his ears. He slowly looked up and gazed upon the night sky with a nervous visage. He panned his vision from the western sky, which was still decorated with wisps of grayish-purple clouds. They slowly glided overhead and masked the stars in scattered fashion. And as his gaze progressed toward the eastern sky, a fist of horror gripped his heart. He saw the black of the sky overhead fading gradually into a violet, which from there was fading into a lighter shade of lavender. The lavender tone was melting into a pinkish color as he stared even further toward the eastern sky. The sun was rising. He couldn't comprehend why he was being held in the grip of this feeling of terror, but he knew, if even only through instinct, that he did not want to be here when the sun rose. In the east, the eastern skies, where it was said by the Christians so many times that the Son of Man would return to gather up the church and the dead in Christ, while all others would be annihilated and judged. He knew, even if only through instinct, that the sun does return. There is always a new day, and the day is not for the damned. As he thought these thoughts, the pinkish color was descending to an orange tone to its declivity. He quickly looked around him, and he rested his sight back upon his broken casket. Would that protect me? He thought. But it was a ruined wreckage, and he had to move quick. The daylight was increasing, and soon the sun would reveal itself. He frantically looked around the cemetery, and in the distance he saw a possibility. A mausoleum. How? How could that protect me? He thought. He would find out. He broke into a full run on surprisingly agile feet toward the gray structure. He felt the pursuit of the fingers of the first rays of sunlight following quickly behind. As he was quickly approaching the marble building, he saw no point of access, and his panic grew to a fever pitch. What would, what could he do? In life, he was somewhat renowned for his circumspection, but this was his second life, his redemption and self-preservation combined with his fury had transformed him now. He reached the mausoleum 
He rounded all four corners of its cracked and chipped existence to see that the access gates to the interior vaults were chained and bolted shut. But the sun was now showing like the lanula in a fingernail over the ridge line, so this mattered not. He wrenched the chains and bolts from one of the access gates and quickly entered the tumble-down structure in short order. The hallway acted only as a shelter from whatever adverse rainy weather there would be. But it wasn't raining now. He looked at both sides of the vault, looking at a great assortment of crypts. Dates that were even parallel with the time that he was alive the first time. The pinkish and orange ambience was now growing brighter in tone, and the air was gradually becoming warmer. The croaking and hissing night bugs had become silent. The quilt of mists that were adorning the old grass of the graveyard were now dissipating. As the vampire looked upon the crypts, he lightly drummed his chin with his fingers in anticipation of his next move. He would rest in one of the crypts today, and then he would have the whole of the coming night to adjust himself properly to his new state of being. With no time to waste, he would carefully pluck the faceplate from one of the crypts, slither his way in, and lie still next to the coffin inside the enclosure. That was, of course, after carefully placing the faceplate back where it belonged, because if and when the cemetery keepers, if there were any at this desolate place, returned, they would be alerted to the upturned grave where he had initially been for so long. They would inspect the entire grounds, fearing that grave robbers had ravaged the place. So, of course, they would inspect the mausoleum, and seeing that the access gate was ripped off, they would be well justified in doing so. So what he planned to do, he then quickly did, and then he rested in that place and waited for the sun to complete its observation of the grounds for the day, and waited for the night to come. The heat of the day was stifling. The vampire lay in the near-roasting enclosure and was annoyed occasionally by the scampering of a rat over his body, or quick scuttling of the brazen centipede across his gaunt features. It was a long, miserable, and restless day for the vampire. In fact, rest was the furthest thing from his mind, as he wanted to lay out the architecture of his new life. Where would he start? With whom would he start? These questions were like a looped rhythm in his mind. As the final remnants of the day began to dissolve, he was struck by another sensation. Hunger. He would have to feed. Still, the minutes passed, and he could feel the heat of the day decrease its clench on the atmosphere. And then, through the faceplate of the crypt where he lay, he could faintly hear the chiming of the symphony of night bugs. As he lay in a place that was cooped and cramped, he had to slither like a serpent to be able to remove the faceplate in order to peer outside to see how much of the night had advanced. When he peered through the crack in the faceplate that he had gently pushed out of its groove, he could see... It was twilight. He could now exit the confines of the tight enclosure. He had all night to make better arrangements now. In the next hour, the night was full-blown and the vampire emerged from the narrow opening of the crypt. His movements were refreshingly limber. He had almost seemed to maneuver much like the night mists. Graceful, stealthy. He replaced the front of the crypt to its proper fitting, and then turned to face the outward world. He was hungry, so it was time to feed. As he made a graceful, nearly levitating stride across the mist-covered grounds of the cemetery, he observed the night hoppers in the grass, quickly making leaps as if to make way for his coming. The vampire advanced toward the opening gates of the graveyard, and noticed that they were still lying in the defeated position they had been since Satan had blown them open before. This made him pause. He looked around, seeing through that glitchy video, and glanced back at his former grave. It hadn't been disturbed. It lay in the same position it had been. It lay angularly, half in, half out of the ruptured grave, resembling the desolate wreckage of a ship that had run aground, broken, busted, and humbled. This gave him two thoughts. One, groundskeepers never came. Maybe there were none. This was good. The second thought was more of an emotion, festering rage, 
and remembrance recalling his captors and accusers, envisioning what they had done to him all those centuries ago. The images that played against the screen of his mind resembled broken movie scenes, and soon his rage transformed into determination. Then, as he stared at the defiled casket, he vowed that people would be just as broken, gutted, and forgotten as that coffin. He turned to exit the cemetery, and he then stood upon a hazed-covered dirt and gravel road which worked its serpentine progression toward the lights of a town. He would start there. He started toward the lights, toward the town, toward the nearest establishment where he could find something to satiate his hunger, and he found it. Act Two A car, which in fact was the most curious appearing thing in the eyes of the vampire as he had never seen one before, was slowly pulling into an open parking slot in front of a tavern. The vampire stayed in the blackened cloak of the night's darkness and was perched upon his haunches as he watched a lone person exit the car and enter the bar. He was well dressed. His clothing was regal and sophisticated, thought the vampire, and as he thought this, looked down at the ragged sleeves on his own arms and the rotted fabric of the rest of his clothing, torn and shredded from ages of decay. It was gradually falling from his body in moistened, frayed clumps. I'll need his clothing, the vampire murmured to himself. With the grace of a cat, he crept across the rooftop and leapt to the ground at the rear of the tavern. There was a vacant lot just adjacent to the tavern's parking lot. There was a dense gathering of pine trees just in front of the vacant lot. It acted as a divider between the field and the parking lot of the tavern. This, the vampire thought, would make an excellent killing ground. If he acted quickly, he could swiftly take the victim out of earshot of any nearby patrons, feast upon his lifeblood, and replace the tattered vesture that he was currently wearing with the lavish clothing of his intended prey. He planned the intricate details of his attack and made his way back to the darkened rooftop with a near weightless leap. He shambled back to the front of the tavern, returned to the perch of his haunches, and waited. The man in the expensive clothing, the dark slate tuxedo, sat at the bar. The tavern's interior was quiet, except for a tune that played on an old jukebox that stood as a lone sentry in the shadowed corner. The song that played was going on about someone being a fool to do someone else's dirty work. As he sat alone, he stared down at the brown, varnished bar, which was nicked and scratched from years of wear from beer bottles, shot glasses, and the knuckles of fingers that possibly removed their wedding rings, the well-dressed man thought. A curious thought, he mused. He continued his vacant stare at the bar's surface. He observed crude writing that someone had etched out, probably with a pocket knife some years back. The writing scribed the words, Never again. A slight chuckle escaped the man's lips. <laughs> God damn right, he muttered. He tried to grasp the thread of his thoughts. His eyes slowly wandered toward the shot glass of bourbon that was now being placed in front of him. He had almost forgotten that he had asked for it a minute or two prior. He was not having a good night. She had walked out on him. He stared at his bourbon. It cast a shimmering amber light reflection upon his weathered features. He picked the glass up, gave it a soft swirl, and downed the whiskey. As he sat the glass back on the bar, he thought, Never again. He looked around and surveyed the rest of the tavern. It was dead tonight. There were only a few smiling faces. A look or two of despair, and there wasn't even a great deal of stale cigarette smoky air either. The bartender slapped a drying towel over his shoulder and approached the man in the tuxedo. Hey, buddy. You ready for another? He looked up at the bartender who was grabbing the empty shot glass. Nah, thanks. I think I'll just make my way home, he replied. No sense in making things worse than they are. The bartender smirked. You're the boss, guy. Have a safe night. The man paid his tally, and after having spent around an hour and a half at the tavern, 
stepped off of the bar stool and started toward the exit, the exit of which he would be walking into the cool, black night and where, unbeknownst to him, a predator waited for him. The man fumbled for the keys in his pocket. As he lightly staggered toward the car, he noticed an abnormal chill drape over his face as a brisk breeze swirled from nothing. He shuddered briefly, looked around at the quiet, near-empty plaza parking lot. Once his keys were in hand, he shrugged and reached for the car's door handle. A slight release of the handle was as far as he was able to get when he was snatched up by the back of his collar with a force and acceleration that stunned him instantly and caused constellations to swirl in his immediate and peripheral vision. Something had him. He was airborne. He watched in mortal horror as his car, as well as the tavern, the parking lot, were now decreasing in size, getting smaller, smaller, smaller. And soon, he was descending upon an open field with the speed of a person with an open parachute. He screamed. When he made his imminent contact with the grass of the field, he landed on an empty bag from a fried chicken restaurant that had obviously been discarded by litterers recently. His body trembled uncontrollably with a debilitating fear he'd never felt before. Not since he was a child and faced unexplained fears that every child faces until age and education make a child privy to rational explanations of what they were afraid of. The chicken restaurant bag, which still contained unfinished food, possibly fries, maybe some remaining nuggets, clung to his lapel. He peeled it off and stared at it foolishly for a second before frantically throwing it to the side. His head whipped back and forth, desperately trying to understand what had just happened. His panicked breaths were visible in rhythmic plumes of steam from his mouth and nostrils. They seemed to form apparitions against the blackened ambience. Crickets could be heard in the field, and in the distance, the steady hissing sound of traffic from the highway could be heard. He looked around with eyes wide, and suddenly his look held fixed to a figure standing in the field. A silhouette. A dark figure about twenty-five yards from where he stood. Thick billowing mists hung suspended from the dark figure's waist down. Hey, who are you? The man in the sweaty tuxedo called. The figure did not respond. I said, who the fuck are you? Did you just see what happened? Nothing. The man thought that maybe he was looking at nothing. Maybe a bush, a small tree, an optical illusion. He couldn't really tell in this unlit darkness. He stood breathing heavily, looking around him. He began to attempt to make slow steps back toward the lights of the tavern and the plaza that were visible beyond the wall of the pine trees. The billowing fog that he'd witnessed a minute prior was now engulfing him where he stood. It was pungent and thick. It had a stench. The smell of long dead things. Eroded life. Then... The bush, the small tree, stood right in front of him. It was no bush. It was no tree. The man in the tuxedo could now see this. It was a man, a man whose eyes were luminescent, glowing much the way phosphorus glows brightly against a black backdrop. The figure's gaze held the man in the tuxedo's eyes locked in a paralyzing stare. What was this? The man thought. Who was this? Where was this? His disorientation grew as he became lost in this figure's fixed stare. Slowly, the visage of the figure formed a grin, one that revealed jagged incisors with two fiercely pronounced canines that looked as though they would be better fitted in the mouth of a good-sized dog, German Shepherd or Doberman but not in the mouth of this frightening, malnourished-looking person who was flashing the most horrific broad smile. The man in the tuxedo was lost in what seemed to be a dream world, only a quarter conscious. Fingers seemed to be materializing from the thick mists. They seemed to be slowly caressing his body. The dark figure's grin remained, and the man's ecstasy was swelling. Who are you? The man in the tuxedo asked shakingly as he stood upon weakened legs that were nearly refusing to hold him up. This question made the figure pause uneasily. 
His wide, fierce clown-like grin was melting. Who exactly was he? He was thinking. Who had he been? Why was it that he was unable to remember something as simple as his name? Without an answer, he said nothing and slowly advanced toward the man in the tuxedo. The sensual murk continued to caress and keep the well-dressed man gripped in a dreamlike state of ecstasy. Sex. He was envisioning sex with an exotic being, the most satisfying hallucination. The hair, the olive skin, the spread, the smell. He could actually believe that this was happening. His vision was being obscured by the thick and palpable clouds of the murk. The dark, grinning being stood just inches in front of him, and gradually he began to be afraid. This being was threatening, imposing. The man in the tuxedo was sensing now that he was in real danger. Being snatched out of his fantasy like a child who was being jerked out of a circus exhibit that he'd snuck into. This was too much. He was wide awake. This figure's evil, grinning face was only inches from his. Who are... He gibbered. I am your death, the vampire croaked. His right hand, now full of unearthly strength that had been rotting in his left armpit just 24 hours ago, was now vertical with fingers wide. Sharp, one-inch claws extended from each finger. The fog swirled around the figure's hand, and after about a moment's time, time enough for the man in this tuxedo to get a direct look at what was in front of him. The wretched claws sliced through the mist, as well as the man in the tuxedo's throat. The haze became pink with molecules of the man's blood, and a crimson fluid covered the vampire's fingers. Arterial life shot in streams from the man's carotid as the vampire bathed. His hunger was sated. A short time passed, and soon the savage vampire completed his opulent bloodbath and feast. The corpse lay in the littered grass with limbs topsy-turvy. It looked like a discarded rag doll in perfect place with the rest of the trash in the field. The vampire, fully satisfied, rose from his haunches in the persistent billowing mist vapors. He was still pestered by the former man in the tuxedo's question. Who are you? Who was he? With no discernible name, he was just a beast. No, this can't be. But this is, of course, something that he could ponder. Currently, he wanted the corpse's clothes, so he began to disrobe the man's body. Shoes, socks, pants, shirt, everything, including cufflinks. As it happens, he was only slightly smaller in size than the dead man had been, so this set of clothing was a near-perfect fit. When the vampire was fully dressed in all but the jacket, he stood regal, against the silky night air, totally enveloped in fog that regarded him as its ruler. He pulled the tuxedo jacket up to his view to reveal the tag on the inner collar. The tag read the label, Vargas of London. The vampire stood in a moment of knowing, informally called a Eureka moment. Vargas. He stood among the mists in this littered field, standing above the lifeless body of his prey. Vargas. My name is Vargas. This would be the name from henceforth that would strike mortal fear into the hearts of everyone. He slid his arms through the sleeves of the jacket which was still spongy with his prey's blood and as it rested upon his torso, he turned to disappear in the haze. The night remained. All was quiet. <laughs>